nothing can separate Even if I ran away Your love never fails I know I still make mistakes You have new mercy for me every day Your love never fails Saved through the ages, your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid because I know that you love me. strong in the water deep, but I'm not alone here in these open seas, cause your love never fails. The chasm was far too wide, I never thought I'd reach the other side, but your love never You stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning mm -hmm. And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me your love never fails You make all things work together for my good You make all things work together for my good You make all things work together for my good You make all things work together for my good You stay You stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night Joy comes in the morning and when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never fails Your love fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. You can have a seat if you'd like. Hi. That I face stronger than the power of the grave, constant in the trial and the change. One thing remains this one. Never gives up, 
never runs out on me Your love never fails, never gives up Never runs out on me Your love never fails, never gives up Never runs out on me Your On and on it goes. And on and on and on and on it goes. It overwhelms and satisfies my soul. And I never ever have to be afraid. One fails and never gives up and never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your Chorus one more time. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your
Trustworthy Savior, my hope is in the Lord. Day after day, our God is reigning, He's never shaken. My hope is in the Lord. Time after time, our God is faithful, trustworthy Savior.
So I'll stand for this last song. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to the praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me. When the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Take away. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your one more time. Blessing. And every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to your praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your glory. Heavenly Father, blessed be your name. May your name be lifted up in the name of Christ Jesus, your Son, by the power of your Spirit, as we remain in the realities of the gospel together as Christians. Blessed be your name. We pray that your name will cover us, that your Spirit will speak into us today as we meditate on your word, your voice, your voice to us. We pray for our children in the other building, our friends in the main sanctuary, and all of our friends and family at home. We pray that in each one of our hearts, your word would be heard 
and experienced to deepen and strengthen us, to heal the places where you have pruned, to strengthen us for your fruit in our lives. Please open your word to us in these ways this morning, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The youth ministries, um, middle school and high school, can be dismissed at this time. I get 10 more minutes of preaching for every one of these I put on here. Is that okay? <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> I know you're lying, but I love you. <laughs> Welcome to those of you up in the main sanctuary as well, and those of you at, at home enjoying a nice cup of coffee in the comfort of your living room. But we really are together, you know, the Lord hears us and sees us and views us and experiences us. He experiences us as one body, and that's really good, along with all the other churches that are worshiping him this morning around the world. He hears us and experiences us as one, so that's a good thing to remember. We're coming up on Christmas, and um, in the month of December, we will do a series beginning next Sunday on the Incarnation, but I'd like to remind you, we'll be in John's Gospel this morning in chapter 15, but I'd like to remind you of the stunning nature of the message of the Gospel. People completely take the Gospel for granted. Um, Even real Christians take the Gospel for granted very often. They, uh, they, it's a ho-hum kind of a thing, but let me remind you the stunning metaphysical nature of what the incarnation really states, what Christianity really, really says. Because it's not just about making the world a better place to live, although that's one of the byproducts of it. It is this. It is that God, the creator of the universe, who is infinitely above the universe, God, the creator of the universe, is infinitely above the universe, infinitely above it, qualitatively, infinitely, not just bigger, infinitely above the created world. There is the creator, the Trinitarian reality of the Father, Son, and the Spirit, and there's everything else that he's created. Now, what Christianity says, what the gospel says, is that because of the evil that we brought into his world, he has actually become a part of of that created world. This is why the angels long, in 1 Peter chapter 1, it says the angels long to look into, Greek word epithumia, it's the word for lust. It means intense desire. The angels long to look into this. Why are they so fascinated with the concept of redemption, with what God has done? Because God has permanently come into the material universe permanently. He's still physical. He, the second person of the Trinity is still a human, a risen human. A resurrected human. Now what that means is, and this is why the angel is so amazed by it, God has actually become a part of his creation, which means his creation cannot not be resurrected. And the evil cannot not be defeated. And the victory is absolutely certain. The incarnation is true. It is amazing. And we'll talk about it beginning next week. But today, (laughs) we are talking about the same person who on the last night of his earthly life, the night before he was crucified, spoke to his believing friends in the upper room. And in chapter 15, he says some of the most profound and, and Amazing things, and and when we read it, some of you have it memorized and and have heard it so many times that you fall into a rut. It's like, you know, driving on some of the roads up in the mountains. There's just certain ruts you fall into, and you're just bumping along in that rut. I want you to get out of that rut for a minute. Pretend you're hearing this 
for the first time and hear what this person who is God in the flesh, redeeming his entire fallen creation, says to his friends the last night before he's crucified because they are going to carry on his mission after he comes back from the dead and pours out his spirit on them. These instructions in this last section of John's gospel are stunningly amazing. I say that over and over and over again because I want to stun you into, I want to wake you up if you're sleepy about the power of what Jesus is saying here and who he really is. And in chapter 14, actually up to this point, chapter 15, verse 1, he has already made several statements. He's instituted the new covenant, and we find this in the synoptics, the first three gospels. John doesn't mention it, but he wrote his last, and he figured everybody had already read the other ones. So he doesn't mention it. But there's no question that on that night, before he, before he was crucified, the night before he was crucified, he instituted the new covenant. He took the main, two of the main elements out of the Passover, the bread and the cup. And he said, this is my, actually my blood. Now, this isn't the Old Testament lamb. This is the new lamb of God. This is why we know John understood all of this because he calls Jesus the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But Jesus instituted the new covenant by saying, this is my blood shed for you. It is the blood of the new covenant. You see this in Luke 22. Now, this would have been stunning to his friends because they'd been celebrating the Passover for 1,500 years. 1,500 years. That's the, think of the history of meditating on God's word and sharing the Passover as the covenant people of God for 1,500 years. And now the Lord says, the Lord Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Messiah, says, that's over. Do you ever have God say to you, that's over? Move forward with me. To have him say this about the old covenant and say this is the new covenant in my blood, absolutely stunning. That happened on that night, earlier than the events we're going to see here. He also supplied a new relationship with God. He promised them a brand new relationship with God. We see this in chapter 14, in which he would indwell his people and his people would dwell in him. This is a metaphysical unity, not unlike the unity in the Trinity, where you have three persons who share the same essence. And he says, you are going to enter into that life with me. You're going to be immersed in the Trinitarian life, into God's life. And you're going to have a relationship with God as a father, exactly like Jesus. Not exactly, but the same benefits as Jesus has, by virtue of your faith in Christ. This is unbelievable to the world. To to have the creator of the universe come into his own creation and then speak into fallen people and draw them directly into his life, the Trinitarian life, and say, uh, you're going to be my children by faith in Christ. The whole world is not his children, only the ones that come to him. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. But the fact that he would do this, this is, and this all, the Lord talked about this on this last night. He institutes this new covenant. He presents this new relationship that humans are going to have and that they didn't have in the old covenant. They did not have this intimate, you in me and I in you, this. They didn't have that in the old covenant. That's why the new covenant is better and new. Read the book of Hebrews. That's why you've got to read the Bible from the correct end. It's why you have to interpret everything through Jesus because this new covenant that he institutes and this new life and relationship that he supplies, stunning, amazing. And they really didn't get it yet. They they would get it after the Spirit was poured out in Acts 2. But he still told them about it up to this point. And he's made the new command, he said, and you know, the new commandment. Um, He said, you are going to love each other. This is the new command I'm giving you. Now that is not because it's not the first time it was ever said. But it was the first time it was ever empowered by the power of God's own life in human hearts to produce a kind of love that is only found in the Trinity. You will love each other. This is my command. That you love one another even as I have loved you. And he demonstrated that. We talked about that a few weeks ago. 
in uh, John 13. Now that has also, it's ringing in their ears as we move on into the evening and we come now to chapter 15 where he begins to explain something to them that is crucially important. We're going to look at the first 17 verses and he reveals three stunning new realities. Like I said, he changes everything. When God became part of his own creation, reality changed. Metaphysical reality changed, and the destiny of the material universe changed. <laughs> I mean, that ought to just, I mean, that ought to blow your mind. And he mentions three things here. He teaches three really stunning things. I'll tell you what they are, and then we'll look at them. First of all, he says, I am the actual true vine. I am the one and only true vine, and we'll see what that means. And then he says, and you are the only true branches, and we'll see what that means. Because you're connected to me, you have a life that the world doesn't have, a life flowing in you because you're connected to me, metaphysically, spiritually joined to me. You have this life. He says this, you are actually living branches. And then he says, that his own Trinitarian love is the evident fruit. Just like grapes on the end of a grape, or, uh, grapes on a grapevine, right? Leaves, grapes, all of it. The, 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 you can tell if the grapevine is alive. It doesn't look like it in the winter. We'll talk about that. But in the spring, you can tell if that grapevine is alive or dead. And he says, the proof is the love, and he repeats the love command twice in the second portion of what we're going to look at, verses 12 to 17. So take note of that. He says, I am the true vine. You really are the only branches that belong to God in the whole wide world. What a stunning reality that is. And the fruit being born out of your life can come under the heading of what I already commanded you, and that is the love of the Trinity flowing through you to one another and, and the overflowing to the world around you. What? What a stunning thing. Let's look at it. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser, the Georgas. The word, the name George comes from the Georgas. It means um, a farmer, a person who tends the vines. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it. Now, remember, he says, I'm actually the vine, and my father is tending the vine. Okay? And what he does <clears throat> is every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it that it may bear more fruit. Now, he says to his friends, to the genuine Christians in front of him, Already you are clean. And uh, there's a play on words in the original, the same root word for prune and clean. So already you are pruned or you're clean because of the word, singular, that I have spoken to you. It's the message of Christ. So abide in me and I in you. Now, he's already talked about this in chapter 14. I'm in you, you in me, and this is by the power of the Spirit this happens. So he tells him, you stay in me. You abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. He uses the term abide or remain. He might have a translation that says remain. Greek word, meno. It's used 10 times in the first 11 verses. Abide, 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 abide. Abide in me and I in you. The branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Do you ever try? And then discover, you know what? I think I'm trying to bear fruit by myself. And it's just not working. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me, remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, anyone not living in Christ, 
He's thrown away like they throw away branches out of a, in a vineyard. A branch that's been broken off is dead, and it gets thrown away. And the branches are gathered up and thrown into a fire and burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Meaning, if, if his word's abiding and he's shaping your thinking, you're going to be praying for the kinds of things that he says are important. His word shapes our intuitions. It shapes our cognition, teaches us how to think, how to feel, and what things are important to the Lord. And then we end up praying according to his will. And he says, and those are the prayers I'm answering. It'll be done for you. By this my Father is glorified. Notice the emphasis on glorifying the Father. That you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. You don't become a disciple by bearing fruit. You bear witness to the fact that you are a disciple by bearing fruit. We'll talk more about that. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Do you know how much the Father loves the Son? The Trinitarian love, the eternal love at the center of the universe, it's indescribable. It's indescribable. It's mind-blowing. If he put all that love in you right now, you would simply pop and go into eternity right now. <laughs> it would be the best thing that ever happened to you. Seriously. And you're, I don't know, some of you are thinking, yes, <laughs> I want to pop right now. <laughs> how much does the Father love the Son? Well, that's how much they both love you. Isn't that amazing? As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Stay in it. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. You're paying attention to me. What does that mean? He says, if my words abide in you, you're paying attention to what I'm saying. You, you care about what I think. You want to obey me. That's what he's getting at here. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept the Father's commandments and abide in his love. It's the abiding in the love that produces the desire to keep the command of God, to keep the instructions of God. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. It's not the kind of joy that the world gives, not the kind of peace that the world gives. Jesus says that in chapter 16. It's a different kind of joy. It's a joy that's in the Trinity, and it's not sourced. The joy isn't sourced in anything in the material realm. And he says, I'm giving you this, and I want you to listen to what I'm saying. There's a kind of joy that's not sourced here, not sourced in this age. It's sourced in God, and it comes to you by the Spirit through his word. Hmm. This is my commandment. Now, well, we'll read through it, and then we'll come back. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves. This is the Greek word. It says servants in the ESV, which is fine. It's a tra good translation. It's doulos. But he's making a distinction between obeying because you're a slave and obeying because you're a son because the obedience is still there. Don't, get, don't think that just because you're a child of God that therefore obedience to the Father doesn't, <laughs> doesn't matter because well, I'm not a slave, so I don't have to obey. That's not what he's after here. He's saying that the purpose in obeying is different for a son than for a slave. And he says, I've called you friends. For the servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. The slave works without knowing why, and the son or the friend works knowing why. It doesn't mean it's always easy, but you know certain things about reality as a person who belongs to God. Um, servant doesn't know what his master's doing, but I've called you friends. For all that I've heard from my father, I have made known to you. Everything the father has said, that the son is eternally generated from the father. That's a whole other topic. But the mind of the father flows through the mind of the son into us. And he says, I've told you everything you need to know. You're not omniscient. I haven't told you everything in the universe, but I've told you everything you need to know. You did not 
choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, remain. It'll be permanent. It'll be eternal. By the way, whatever you do for the Lord and in the Lord has eternal ramifications for everyone who receives it and for you who offer it. Any, anything you do in the name of Christ, what you say, how you live, your service to others, these minor things that other people might say, well, that's not much, that's, you know, and you might say that too. But if you're doing it in the name of Christ, it has an eternal lasting, it abides. He uses this term again, abides, remains. The fruit will remain. You should go and bear fruit and your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask, now look at the prayer again, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. And once again, in the name of Christ means according to his will. These things I command you so that you will love one another. See, he repeats it again. In that last paragraph, he, re- he says at first you're going to love each other and then at the end he says I'm telling you all this. Let's look through this a little more carefully. He himself is the vine. Um, We don't have time, I don't think. No, we don't. We don't have time, but I would like to give you some passages. If If you're a student of the Bible, let me point something out. When he says he's the vine to these people, he is really saying he is the ultimate Israel. That's what he's really saying here. You say, well, how do you know that? It's because in the Old Testament, at least eight times in the Old Testament, Israel is called Yahweh's vine. Let me give you the passages. Um, Psalm 80, that's the clearest probably, and if we had time, if this were a classroom and we were taking notes, we would look at every one of these. So, when you get home this afternoon, uh, Psalm 80, verses 8 to 16, Isaiah 5, that's a parable, Isaiah 5, 1 to 7, is a parable where Israel is the vine planted by Yahweh in Palestine, or in, in Canaan. Isaiah 5, Isaiah 27, Isaiah 27, verses 2 through 6. Jeremiah 2, 21, he talks about Israel being a vine. Ezekiel 15, verses 2 through 6, Israel is a vine. Ezekiel 17, 5 to 10, Israel is a vine. Ezekiel 19, 10 to 14. And if you want these, they'll be on the internet, you know. The, the notes are on the internet, by the way. <laughs> so you're breaking your hand, writing this down. Going, oh, thanks. And you can email me anytime for any of the notes. Rick at trail.org. Um, Ezekiel 15, Ezekiel 17, Ezekiel 19, 10 to 14. Hosea 10, 1 to 2. That's a really amazing one. In all of these places, at least eight, and maybe more, the eight that I counted, Israel is called the vine of Yahweh. So when he said, when Jesus, now put yourself in a Jewish context, Jesus is saying to his friends who know all these passages, because they were raised on the Old Testament. They know all these passages. Jesus says, I am the vine. Now he's previously said, I am the shepherd. I am the one who supplies the water. You know, one and another and another. And this is the last of the I am statements. There's seven of them in, in, uh, in John's gospel. I am the vine. What he's saying is, I am, for all intents and purposes, the fulfillment of everything Israel was, or should, or pointed to, actually. I have done what Israel could not do. When Israel was tempted in the desert, they fell into idolatry. When I was tempted in the desert, I told the devil to go elsewhere. (laughs) I'm trying to think of something nice to say. This is church. Um, Israel failed to obey Yahweh, failed to live under the law. What did Jesus do? He succeeded in it, lived completely under the law. He did everything Israel was supposed to do. God told the world through Abraham, he was going to bless the world through the seed of Abraham. Galatians chapter 3, Jesus is the seed of Abraham. And that's why when he says this, what he's saying to these people is, take your faith out of your lineage and put it in me. Take your faith out of your religious tradition. Put it in me personally. That's, that's, that's really scary. I mean, that's like jumping out of a burning building into somebody's arms. And they just say, trust me, I'll catch you. Oh yeah, how do I know? 
<laughs> it's, well, he's saying, you have to trust me. And we know because he came back from the dead, so he's trustworthy. But that idea is just shocking to these people. They must have been sitting there looking at the cup and the bread and thinking, oh my goodness. Look, listen to what he is saying. When he says, I am the true vine, this is what he means. I'm the only source of spiritual life, the only one that has ever been, Israel pointed to me. Now, some of you might be doing some theology. You might be thinking, well, Israel's off the map then. Uh, Romans 11 says that God will bring Israel to the Messiah too. In my opinion, I'm among those who believe that Israel will be revived as a nation, as a race, and they'll belong to Christ. But nevertheless, what he's saying here is, for all intents and purposes, I am the vine. I mean, it's quite stunning. Which means he's the only source of life, and that brings us to the next thing, verses 2 to 11. His disciples are the only living branches of God's life on earth. Do you see the implications of what he's saying? A person who's a disciple of Jesus Christ is the only, if you're the only Christian in a given room, spiritually, the angels would look at that and see death all around and one life, you. Because it's the life of Christ flowing in you. You are the branches. Because you belong to me, my life flows through you into a fallen world. It's amazing. So he reveals himself as the true vine. He reveals his disciples as the living branches. And that's why the Father tends them. He wants to make sure that they're growing. And then third, his Trinitarian love. This is verses 12 to 17. His Trinitarian love is the evident fruit of his life into his disciples. Look at verses 12 and 13. So they love just like Jesus did. Jot down a passage I quoted to you a couple of weeks ago. First John chapter 4, verses 7 to 12. First John 4, 7 to 12. Same author, John the Apostle. But uh, he actually, in First John, very clearly says, this is where it says that God is love, and anybody that belongs to him knows how to love, has the skill of the Trinitarian love. The skill of the Trinitarian love. The skill of the Trinitarian love, the love that is in between the Father and the Son and the Spirit, that skill and that power is in a person who belongs to Christ. (laughs) How's that going? It's amazing. Why? Because they are his friends and not simply his slaves. Do you see that in verses 14 and 15? This fruit of love comes because they are now the friends of Christ. So he uses the metaphors, friends versus slaves, living branches versus dead, faithless branches. And they obey, but for a different reason, like I said before. Some people say, well, if you're telling me to obey God, that sounds like slavery. Well, then you don't get it. You don't understand it all. Interesting, Paul used the same word for himself in a very honorable way. I'm a slave of Christ, doulos. I'm a servant of Christ. He said, that's a wonderful thing. A child of God says, I want to obey God. I want him to run my life. A child of God says, I want the Lord to run my life. That's not very American. But then, as I've mentioned on several occasions the last couple of years, God actually is not an American. (gasps) What? And furthermore, Neither is Jesus. What? Furthermore, they don't even want to be. I don't blame them. Yeah, yeah. Um, There's a lot of things in our culture, Western culture, that emphasize us never doing what anybody ever, ever tells us. When you come to the Lord, you're coming to a true Lord. And if he says something, a genuine believer says, well, I hadn't thought of it that way. I may have to struggle, but I want to do what he wants done in my life. And they do it because they love him, because he loves them, not because they're slaves. They're not earning it. See, a slave is earning. A son is an inheritor. By the way, the women are called sons too. I know that that doesn't sound very cool in our culture right now, but it's a wonderful, honorable title. The women are called sons of God. It means you inherit You have his name. That's what it means to be a son. So men and women are all called sons of God. Isn't that interesting? 
And you go, I don't like it, you know? Well, the guys are called the bride of Christ, too. So you got to just kind of <laughs> use the metaphors the way they're intended. And don't get, God doesn't have a gender chip on his shoulder, okay? So what we have is a marvelous friendship, sonship connection with our Heavenly Father that makes us want to obey Him, and that's why He talks about the commands here. Because their discipleship, notice in verse 16, their discipleship was His idea before it was theirs. Did you know that? He says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Now, it feels like you chose Him. And Christians argue about this all the time, late at night over coffee or other beverages. And they argue about, well, did he choose me or did I choose him or I can't be both and blah, 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 blah. And my suggestion, I've been doing this for years, my suggestion is that you smile and listen and not get involved in the argument because it is actually both, but he makes it very, very clear that his decision precedes ours, which makes perfect sense. It just makes perfect sense that his decision precedes ours. And, uh, and so he says, you didn't choose me. Ultimately, I chose you. Now, that's wonderful. Christian friend, God chose you. Ephesians 1 says you were predestined. It goes along the same lines, the same concept. That God loved you before you were here, knowing you were coming. <laughs> That's just so cool. You didn't choose me, I chose you. And verses 16 and 17, because he intends to use their prayers, that's why he says prayer there, and their lives to produce fruit in his name. Did you catch that? His love is the evident fruit of the life. So the life is flowing. It produces this love. So they love like Jesus did because they are his friends and not just slaves. Because their discipleship was his idea before it was theirs. And because he intends to use their prayers and their lives to spread his life, to further his kingdom. It's amazing. So let me clarify a couple things. Now, that's the passage, and you see the three things, stunning things he says. Let me clarify a couple things. First of all, and uh, some people, when they read this, they get quite scared because they look, at, they look at the part where he says about the branches that are broken off. They're branching me that doesn't bear fruit. And so they say to themselves, I haven't borne enough fruit. Maybe he's going to break me off. And you've got to understand that's not what he means by this. He's not saying that, that uh, he's going to break you off if you don't bear enough fruit. What he's saying is fruit is the is the what is produced by the life of the Spirit in a person's life. And so, well, then what about the branches that are broken off? Well, the fruitless, note this, the fruitless branches are not his true disciples. They are, they are either the generation, remember there was a generation of Jews who knew the vine imagery? They knew the vine imagery from the Old Testament. And if they were asked, are we in the vine? They would say yes, because we're in Israel. But it's a generation of Israel that killed the Messiah, basically. Now, that could be the vine, uh, the fruitless vine in me, broken off. Whatever it is, it's the people who don't really believe in him. It could be that Jewish generation. Or it could be people like Judas who are associated with Christ but don't trust him. Fake believers. The New Testament has a description of fake believers. And I've said it before, it's not a bad idea for a genuine Christian to ask themselves, am I... Am I really a believer? Have I given my life to Christ? Um, even a question like, have I been baptized? Have I, do I see the fruit of the Spirit in my life? That's not an unhealthy question to ask, but it's not there to, pre, to bring panic. Because in chapter 10, same book, John's Gospel, chapter 10, 27 to 30, Jesus says, I know all of my sheep and I don't lose any of them. So however you're going to interpret this, it's not a threat that you're going to lose your salvation if you're a genuine believer. Okay, so let's get that clear right up front. It's an exhortation to say, I want to bear fruit. That's what it is. And an exhortation to abide, to stay in with the Lord. And uh, invariably, as a pastor, when I come across folks who read apostasy warnings in the Bible, um, I always tell them the same thing. And some of you know what I'm going to say. If this warning makes you draw close to the Lord, that means you're a genuine Christian. If the warning makes you mad and you say, well, how dare God threaten me and, and I have my own and I'm doing my own thing. I have got my own deal with God. Well, that could be a problem. But all the genuine believers say when they hear this, they go, am I being fruitful enough? Not an unhealthy question to ask, 
but not to create panic in your life. Does that make sense to you? Yeah? Nod? Yeah? Okay. So let's get that cleared up. It cannot refer to a genuine believer because Jesus already said he never loses any of those. And here's the second thing. The fruit among the disciples, and this is crucial because you can misread this and people do it often. The fruit among the disciples is the result of abiding in the vine, not the other way around. The fruit doesn't produce the abiding. The abiding produces the fruit. And we'll talk about abiding. I'm going to give you some advice here in a minute. But you got to get this straight. The life comes through because you're abiding in the Lord. His life literally comes through you. And you may not be an entire vineyard full of grapes, okay? But like I said before, you can tell if a vine is alive by just looking at it. There's a new kind of life. There's life there. And you can tell the difference between a dead one and a live one. And it, it doesn't take a genius to do it. So what he's saying is, it's the life that produces the fruit, not the fruit that produces the life. So a Christian, when they want to bear fruit, they don't go, fruit, 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 fruit. No. I'm going to make fruit. You'll make a stroke. That's what you'll do. A Christian doesn't do that. A Christian says, I want to abide in the Lord and let the fruit of the Spirit flow through me. And we'll see, I'll, I'll tell you, there's some practical advice about this. But the abiding is the key. The fruit is produced by the abiding. And the fruit, obviously, is personal loyalty to Him, obedience to Him, the fruit of the Spirit, the work of God's life within us and through us. So focusing on Him, rather, sometimes when people read this, they end up focusing more on the on the fruit than they do on the Lord. And the goal of this is to abide in the Lord. That's why 10 times abide. We're supposed to focus on him and then look for how we can serve him, okay? Let me give you some advice in our last few minutes here. Uh, first of all, this, abiding in Christ is not difficult. Some of you might be thinking that when you read this. Uh, abiding in Christ is not difficult. However, we do have to cooperate with him. You note that in here? Do you see what he's saying? It's natural for a branch to abide in the vine, okay? It's not difficult to remain in Christ and to abide in Christ, but you do have to want to do it. You do have to have in your heart a desire to abide. Uh, turn with me to Romans chapter 12. A great passage along the same line. Romans 12, the Apostle Paul <laughs> Romans 12, verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. In other words, what is good. You'll find out what God's will is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You'll be able to figure it out as, and you'll be able to test daily how to walk, how to live, the skill of living in God and in Christ by allowing him to transform you. And it's a passive imperative, which means it's a command to allow something to happen to you, a command to allow something to happen to you. This is what Jesus is talking about when he talks about abiding. It's not difficult. Let me give you three pieces of advice in our closing moments here. First, lean, in, three things. You say, well, how do I abide? I can see abiding is important. It's used 10 times. I didn't know that. That's amazing. What do I do? Number one, you can see it right there in the first two verses. Lean into the pruning. Lean into the Father's pruning. You want to abide? Pruning, pruning. What does that mean? It means cutting stuff off. Oh. <laughs> um, will it hurt? Uh-huh. <laughs> sometimes. But you say, well, I want to abide. Well, then lean into the corrections and the pruning because sometimes it's not just dead wood he gets rid of. It's some live wood that's a huge distraction and live wood that's not good for your spiritual life. It's, it's there, but he's trimming it for fruit. 
this is a quote from Merrill Tenney, who's with the Lord now, but he for many years was a professor at Dallas Seminary, wrote a bunch of commentaries. And his commentary on John, he says this, Viticulture, which is vines, consists mainly of pruning. In pruning a vine, two principles are generally observed. First, all dead wood must be ruthlessly removed. Second, the live wood must be cut back drastically. Dead wood harbors insects and disease that may cause the vine to rot, to say nothing of being unproductive and unsightly. Live wood must be trimmed back in order to prevent such heavy growth that the life of the vine goes into the wood rather than into the fruit. The vineyards in the early spring look like a collection of barren, bleeding stumps. But in the fall, they are filled with luxuriant purple grapes. As the farmer wields the pruning knife on his vines, so God cuts dead wood out from among his saints and often cuts back the living wood so far that his method seems cruel. Nevertheless, from those who have suffered, from those who have suffered the most, there often comes the greatest fruitfulness. And that is absolutely true. We have no theology of suffering in the Western church, or very little theology of suffering. We don't see it as valuable when God trims. James chapter 1, the first four verses, he says, you should consider it a good thing when your life heats up and the dross comes to the top because of the trials, because then your faith is being purified. The fact of the matter is a lot of people just don't care if their faith is purified. They're just looking for fire insurance. But God cares more about it than we do. So here's lesson number one. If you don't want to abide, lean into the pruning. If God has taken something out of your life, even something you thought was perfectly fine and good, then say, okay, Lord, how can I serve you in this process? How can I trust you for whatever healing is necessary? How can, I, how can your fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, be seen in my life in the process of this thing? And it's individual for each person. And remember that the Lord... Um, we are fruit-bearing trees, not ornamentals. I tell young pastors this a lot. A church is a farm. It's not Disneyland, which means it's a work in progress. There's, uh, and trimming for fruit is very different than trimming for looks. If you go to Disneyland, you can see bushes that look like Mickey Mouse. The bush might not have liked that. The bush might have said, hey, look, I'm a bush here. I'm not Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Seriously, that's called topiary. God doesn't do topiary on us. He prunes us for fruit. And a, a tree that's been pruned for fruit is not an ornamental. It's fruit bearing. And that's us, which means he doesn't prune us to make us look better to the world. Okay, we'll put a finer point on it. Physical success in this world is not always a good witness. And sometimes people think, well, in order to be a good witness, I need to be healthy and wealthy and good-looking and tan and skinny. And God goes, are you kidding me? Um, he trims for fruit, and the fruit is the internal work of the Spirit and then the life of God flowing through us to other people, which is why broken people, Paul says about himself in 2 Corinthians 4, the Lord shines through the broken pots. That's us. So he trims for fruit. We are not ornamentals. Also notice that you don't trim yourself. Some people would love to be able to trim themselves. Why? Well, because then they can only cut off the stuff they don't like. Notice it's the farmer who does the trimming, not us. We're, we are not our own hobby. Um, so how does he do it? Through the difficulties and the traumas of life. The, the venue for spiritual growth is everyday life. We don't trim ourselves. And notice we are all a work in progress, especially the person you're upset with where you're saying to God, you need to trim that off of them. <laughs> Do you have anybody like that? Somebody came into your mind, well, I, I can tell you some trimming ought to be happening there. <laughs> well, it's good to be patient with one another. This is how you love each other, by being patient with each other and realizing, well, <clears throat> I think God's working in that guy's life. I hope he's working in his life as graciously as he's working in mine. And uh, we're all a work in progress. And the church is also a working farm, not Disneyland. So 
Getting this into our heads about leaning into the pruning is crucial if we're going to abide in Christ. Here's the second thing to do. Take the Son's words in. See in verse 3 and verse 7. You notice the connection between the work of the Spirit and the work of the Word. The Word and the Spirit overlap metaphysically. The Word of God is the voice of God. The Spirit of God is the voice of God. When, God, when you open God's Word as a Christian... You know, I mean, we all have bad days. We have these days where you go, I'm not getting anything out of the Bible today. I get that. That happens to me too. You know, we have these down times. But we also know the times where we opened the scriptures and our soul was just nourished in it. And oftentimes this happens in church. In fact, it's my prayer every single Sunday, Wednesday, anytime I teach. Anytime I'm, I'm opening the word in, uh, in the presence of other people, it's always my prayer nourish myself and everyone else, give the souls of your people something to be nourished by. And notice that this is part of abiding. You say, I want to abide. Then do the things that enable you to understand the power of the gospel in the scriptures. Go to the word of God. Because he says, you're clean because the word I spoke to you. You've already been pruned. When you're in the word of God on a regular basis, there's pruning that happens all the time. And there's cleansing that happens all the time. And there's nourishing that happens all the time. How can I abide? Be in a place where you're taking in the Word of God on a regular basis. His words, His actual words, where He's written them down and His voice comes across to you. By the way, go to churches, and there are many good churches, you know. Some, church, everybody, some people think about their church that it's a shame God had to make any other ones because we want to be the only church where God is at work. That's not true. God uses all kinds of different styles, but I'll tell you one thing to look for. Look for a church where they open the Bible and they teach it from the Christocentric, the Christ-centered, gospel-centered perspective. Open the Bible. Go places where people are opening the scriptures and applying them through the ministry and the word of Jesus Christ. And it will nourish your soul. More or less. People say, I haven't found a church I like. Go to the one you hate the least. If you've tried them all, <laughs> go to the one you hate the least and, and see if it's a place where they can open the Bible. If you're doing that, something good will happen in your soul. And church isn't a club. This isn't a club meeting. This is a place where we come, we lay our souls out before God. We say, would you please speak to my heart through your word today because I want to be loyal to Jesus and I want to lean into the pruning and I want you to nourish my soul with your kind of thinking. And any church that's doing that, regardless of the style of their worship or the style of their building or their tent or whatever it is they're meeting in, look for those things. Abiding. Lean in to the pruning Take the Son's words, take in the Son's words, and third, submit to the Spirit's transformation. And you see that clearly in 7 and 16, and it's prayer. The Spirit's transformation, the very first thing a person experiences, even before, in my opinion, even before they express faith, the regeneration takes place on the inside of them, and they automatically want to talk to God in the name of Christ. And that's why he mentions prayer twice. So what you want to do is submit to the Spirit's transformation. I read to you from uh, Romans 12. The Holy Spirit is literally shaping our lives through the Word of God, and this is how we abide, and that's how the fruit comes. If you just focus on the fruit and not the transformation on the inside, you end up with hypocrisy, and there's a ton of that out there. But if you let the Spirit of God change you from the inside, bring you into loyalty to Christ... It's amazing. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. Some of you were saying, when's he going to turn to Galatians? Now. Galatians 5. Now he contrasts the life of the spirit versus the life of the flesh. And um, uh, look at verse 19. Begin in verse 19. Galatians chapter 5 verse 19. The works of the flesh are evident. They're obvious. Everybody knows what they are, Paul says. Sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. The three words that go together for most of what's on TV. Verse 20. Idolatry, sorcery, enmity. That means having enemies. Strife, jealousy, fits of anger. 
Isn't that interesting? Rage. Fits of anger. Rivalries. Dissensions. Divisions. Envy. And a lot of things that are on the internet. Drunkenness. Orgies. And things like these. It's an ad hoc list. He says, you, you know, you get the feel. He says, you know what I'm saying here. He says, that's the old life. That's not the way people live who belong to God. I warn you, as I warned you before, those who do such, meaning those who live in that lifestyle unrepentantly, that's what he means. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. They're not, they're dead. The fruit's not there. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Do you remember the commands now? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Wouldn't you rather be kind than always right? Kindness, goodness, faithfulness. That means being able to be trusted. Gentleness, self-control, the ability to do what you intend and not do what you do not intend. That's self-control. Um, Against such things there is no law. These are good things, he says. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, then let us also walk by the Spirit. And let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So you see the contrast. So what, when you talk about abiding, it starts by leaning into the pruning process. It progresses by taking in the word of God and letting the Lord continue to cleanse our thinking. Is he pulling stuff out of your life? Is he weeding? Is he trimming? Or has he done it without your permission? Something's been taken away from you that you thought was perfectly good. It might have been, not a sin or anything, but something's been removed. And the Lord is saying, I'm doing something good in this. Can you lean into that? Can you let the word of God nourish And then can you embrace the transformation of the Holy Spirit primarily through prayer and then moving into this transformation process we just described in Galatians? Is that too much for you to take in on a Sunday morning? I know it's like drinking from a fire hydrant, I know. But seriously, as we as Christians consider what the Lord is doing in our lives, Let's just close our eyes for a second. Just close your eyes. We're done here, but let's close our eyes. Take the things that God has spoken to you, where he said, I'm trimming that, or I already did, but it's for your good and not to hurt you. And my word is crucial, and I'd like you to get back into it. And prayer is the heart of the Spirit's work in and among us. And I'd like you to get back into the prayer life that you once had or that you would like to have. And let that abiding actually transform right now. The best place to start with that is baptism, and we have a baptism after the second service. If you haven't been baptized, that's the first step of abiding in Christ, the first step of abiding in Christ. So I encourage you to come back around 1230 and get baptized. Heavenly Father, um, you know what you're doing in our souls. We really don't know each other that well. But we pray, I pray, that your spirit would work in us in such a way that our abiding in you would produce this fruit, this prayer, this love, this mission, this loyalty to Christ that we see described here. We pray that for ourselves and for our whole church. And Father, I ask on behalf of those who may be baptized today that you would draw them in, fill them with your spirit. And those who are perhaps rededicating their lives to you right now, that you'd fill them with your spirit and with the confidence of the forgiveness you offer. And let our lives bear fruit, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.